I think my role tonight is to be something of the Cassandra on the panel, which is perhaps fitting because, as we all know, there's no zealot like the converted. And I have been converted. Before I started in the Scannon Center about a year ago, uh, I worked at the Cato Institute for over 20 years. I was responsible for energy and environmental policy there. I was the man responsible for a tremendous amount of the climate skeptic work that came out of Cato. But over my time at Cato, I began to lose faith in those narratives. And uh, when I left uh, Cato to start the Libertarian Niskanen Center, uh, one of the things I hoped to do was to convince libertarians that how they feel about individual rights and liberties of role the state should have nothing to do with how they feel about atmospheric physics. This is an entirely separate matter. Uh, how far I'm getting on that, you can tell by tonight's Republican debate when you get back and read Twitter. Um, my argument tonight is that the goal embraced uh, in Paris, the goals are worthwhile. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that Todd accomplished as much as humanly was possible at, those at, that, uh, at that conference and probably even more than virtually anybody had expected. But in the words, uh, but the means of achieving that goal uh, that was agreed to in Paris are in James Hansen's words, bullshit. Now that's scientific jargon for without much prospect for success. So hence, if we're going to ask the question, what next for climate policy, my answer is one hell of a lot of work because nothing has really been accomplished in Paris. So uh, first, a few kind words about the goal. We did accomplish a goal, and goals are important things. And it's worthy to have a two degree centigrade goal uh, for future warming. If anyone needs to be reminded of why that is, uh, it's because at two degrees Celsius, we're out of the range of human experience with the climate. Uh, to put this into context, uh, the world was only four to seven degrees cooler during the last ice age. Moving temperatures in the opposite direction flirts with equally extreme climate conditions. The last time the planet saw greenhouse gas concentrations where they are at present was about three million years ago. Temperatures then were only two to five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than they are today, but uh, the Arctic ice cap didn't exist and sea levels were 33 to 131 feet greater than they are today. Even in a one degree warming world, which we hit in 2015, and by that I mean uh, warming above uh, pre-industrial levels, puts us in nearly unprecedented historical space. Economic damages become the expectation and catastrophic risks still are very real. And again, beyond 2C, we're in a world of not knowing what in the heck we have in store for us. We've never experienced it. Uh, we know through paleoclimactic data that it can be quite dramatic. If we accept the IPCC narratives, uh, which I do, about what a doubling of uh, atmospheric uh, greenhouse gas concentrations might mean uh, over the long haul. Uh, economist Marty Weitzman at, at, uh, at Harvard estimates that there's about a 10% chance that warming will exceed 11 degrees Fahrenheit. That's simply because the most likely range of 1.5 to 4 degrees Celsius is likely. There's a 66% chance of it. Not to say that would be particularly manageable, but that's a likely scenario. There are other scenarios as well. And when we look at the, distri the full distribution of possible outcomes, it gives you a better idea of the real risks we're facing. So the point here is the two degrees Celsius uh, target that was agreed to in Paris is very meaningful and very real and worth applauding. The national, the national commitments made in Paris are utterly inadequate, however, to that task. Uh, depending upon which emission scenarios you look at and expectations regarding future temperature change, uh, what we find is that the intended national determination contributions, the INDCs that Todd mentioned, only get us about halfway from current trends to the two degrees Celsius goal. Different projections tell you how close we've got. Uh, Todd mentioned 2.7 degrees. The United Nations Environmental Program said no. If you take the INDC commitments and plug them into our model, we probably get three to three to five uh, degrees Celsius warming by the end of the century. So pick them, deciding what you want, but it only gets you about halfway there. And that's if those promises are kept. Those promises, however, are unlikely to be kept. Developing nations alone estimate that the cost of making good on the promises made in Paris total about $3.5 trillion. $2.5 trillion in India alone. I think there's little prospect of those, uh, those commitments being reached, particularly since part of the deal was that the developing world helps foot the bill at only $100 billion a year, which isn't close enough to covering the gap. And anybody who thinks that the United States and other nations are really going to make good on that $100 billion, I think, are kidding themselves. The lack of enforcement mechanism is awful, is, is also uh, crippling. This agreement, in short, really is akin to a joint New Year's Eve resolution. <laughs> Everyone has agreed to a really great goal, but there's no enforcement. And that's not to Todd's detriment. There's only so much one can do with the Republican Congress.
Uh, but without enforcement mechanisms, uh, we don't really have much faith that anyone is going to be uh, held to uh, standards with regards to their practices. The cold hard truth is that staying below two degrees centigrade requires some really heroic assumptions now. Globally, a third of all oil reserves, half of gas reserves, and about 80% of the current coal reserves must remain unused and in the ground from 2010 to 2050 in order to meet the two degrees C target. Bottom line. In other words, the things that Bernie Sanders are talking about, the Leave in the Ground campaign, is actually the sort of thing that has to happen if we're really going to meet that target. Major sustained mitigation, twice what was committed to in Paris, has to occur, plus economic breakthroughs have to occur in carbon captions and storage, for which costs need to be reduced by an order of magnitude to happen, plus, most critically, technology which is now only speculative has to exist to remove CO2 from the atmosphere on a massive scale. And that's according to the latest IPCC report. Now, either a fair allocation of per capita emissions across nations or a shared reduction in emissions across nations would require emissions reductions in the developing world that are titanically more ambitious than anything the US, China, or Europe has put on the table thus far. To give you an idea of that, a fair allocation of emissions reductions, in other words, every country in the world had the same limit of per capita emissions. That would require the U.S. to zero out greenhouse gas emissions within 25 years to the 2C target. Of course, we're not going to agree to do that. That gives you an idea of why the developing world isn't wild about the commitments made by the developed world. If we just have a shared reduction, which is not quite the same per capita, but everyone has to cut emissions at the same level, uh, if we were to agree to that regime, we would have to see an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions within the next 25 years. Are we currently on that trajectory? No. Contrast that with uh, what we heard about the Clean Power Plan. If you look at the EPA estimates, coal share of the electricity uh, market will decline from 37% in 2013 under the CPP to 28% in 2030. This is not a serious program to get us to a two degree C target if that's really your goal. People who've been doing modeling on this, many of whom are in this room and elsewhere in academia and in the consulting business trying to figure out what the permit prices for the clean power plan would be if they go into play, you would take all the assumptions from the EPA as a given what we learn is that the emissions trading regime under the Clean Power Plan will give us a carbon price of $6 a ton. $6 a ton is nowhere near the social cost of carbon according to any calculation, nor is it enough to reduce greenhouse gas emissions enough to do the job. So what to do? One of the reasons that uh, I'm in favor of a carbon tax is that minimizing the cost of reducing greenhouse gas emissions is vital. The reason that in Paris, no one joined hands and agreed to the kind of mitigations required to get to 2C is because it was simply too costly to sell to their public. No matter what pollsters have been telling them, every single delegate in that room understood the difficulty of selling a real agenda to get to 2C. So if we want to have any prospect of selling real emissions cuts, they have to be done cheaply. And I believe putting a carbon tax uh, on emissions and leaving it to market actors to decide how best to go about that practice is infinitely cheaper than having orders out of EPA or regulators or quotas or anything of the kind. Of that, about 80% of economists, no matter whether liberal, conservative, would all agree. I don't think there's a lot of a disagreement in the academic community about that. Unfortunately, current international negotiations are not on this track. Uh, the fight over the allocation of emissions rights, who pays for emissions reductions, the cost of noncompliance, has always been on the table and always will be on the table. I don't think that we are in a place where we can see policy moving in the sort of mitigation direction we need. We're certainly not hearing crisp conversations about carbon taxation on the international stage. I think that's what's required. So how do we do that? Uh, well, I think the, f the first thing the United States can do is unilaterally act to adopt a carbon tax and then tax, tax imports for the same amount of emissions that would have occurred had they been produced in the United States. The beauty of this is, in and of itself, that's not going to do enough about global temperature, granted. That's absolutely clear. But if you're in the business of exporting to the United States, you now have a choice. Would you rather have the U.S. Treasury capturing carbon tax revenue, or would you rather have your Treasury capturing target ta carbon tax revenue? Anybody who exports significantly to the United States would have a great incentive to capture that revenue. There are also nations around the world, in Europe and elsewhere, that might be game to a joint agreement on carbon taxation, which would allow us to take advantage of something that economist Bill Norhouse calls the Climate Club, where a group of nations would agree to a uniform or at least a reasonably shared level of uh, carbon pricing, and we would now have a trading regime, we would now have a world in which imports into that, uh, into that trading zone would face the same sort of taxes at the border, but within the trading zone, none. And before you know it, you might very well find international agreements moving endogenously in that direction. 
I think that is infinitely more promising than the current track we're on, which I don't see getting anywhere near close enough to the emissions reductions we need, uh, given the fact that we've been at this game now for many decades, and we still have very little show for it now except for a joint promise for action. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs>